Now, let me introduce the speaker of the day. Welcome, Dr. Naveen. Naveen uh, Nabodri is a founder trustee of Dakshin Foundation and currently serves as its director. Trained as a marine biologist, he has worked in diverse coastal, marine, and island systems across India. He heads the Biodiversity and Resource Monitoring Program and oversees the establishment and implementation of several marine conservation projects at Dakshin's field sites, such as the community-led fisheries management in the Lakshadweep Islands, citizen science programs in the Andaman Islands, and the long-term monitoring of coral reef ecosystems in the Andamans. He has served on the editorial board of Current Science and was an invited member of the Aquaculture and Marine Biotechnology Task Force of the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So it's a pleasure having you here, Naveen. Please, the floor is all yours now. Thank you, Mokta. Thanks for that <coughs> introduction. Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk much. I'll get into the presentation. I need uh, access to screen sharing. Oh, Pratish, can you do that? Can you give access to Naveen? Yeah, please, please check it now. Yeah, it's so, working. Thanks. All right. So I have a quick few slides about, you know, the organization as well, so that you have some context as to, you know, who I am and the kind of work that I'm talking about as well. So I'm, like uh, Mukta said, I'm Naveen Namutri, director of the Action Foundation. We're an organization based in Bangalore. Um, 12 years since we've, uh, you know, started. Dakshin's mission is uh, mainly to, you know, inform and advocate for conservation and natural resource management, but we do it with a very strong uh, centering around sustain, uh, sustainability, access to, you know, resources and, you know, overall in an environmental justice framework. So equity and environmental justice is like the framework of which we work, uh, mainly because quite often it's, even when you engage in conservation activities, there's often a cost to, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, some of the actions that need to be done to protect our natural resources. And it's quite often the, the communities, the, you know, marginalized communities, and our primary focus is with the small scale fishery sector. So, you know, they are also the ones that get affected when there are conservation measures put in place as well. So we ensure that, you know, there's a balance between uh, you know, justice as well as conservation efforts. Um, so, would like to say that you know we we support the rights of local communities to sustainable utilize resources and also to exercise their cultural rights and worldviews. And I think, in, I mean, we feel this kind of an approach is increasingly relevant in the kind of you know social political kind of you know scenarios not just in the country, but generally globally as well. Um, where we work, we work along the coastline, obviously, but also we have a very strong focus on both the island systems, both Lakshadweep Islands, as well as the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, we also work in, you know, on and off in Karnataka, Maharashtra, we have a uh, strong presence, we used to have a strong presence. In Orissa, we have been working since the last 15 years or so, more than, I mean, even before Dakshin was formed, a lot of us were working there. Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh as well. Uh, we have four programs, uh, four largish programs. Um, the one that I am involved with is the Biodiversity and Resource Monitoring Program, um, where I head the Sustainable Fisheries. It has two sub-programs, um, you know, so we're looking at environmental, uh, you know, the objective is to look at participatory methods in which one can uh, not just do resource monitoring, but also, you know, resource management as well. Um, you have two sub-programs, one is the marine flagships and the other is sustainable fisheries. I head the sustainable fisheries program, my colleague Kath Chanka heads the, uh, you know, flagship species program. The flagship species program focuses on large charismatic marine, you know, usually vertebrates. Um, the not and uh, we do a fair bit of research on on some of these groups, but not just uh, focus on the the ecological and biological aspects of these species, but also the kind of often these species because of their charismatic nature, uh, you know, like along the entire coast of India, pretty much every turtle nesting site has at least one or two small groups working at the grassroots 
with total conservation. So there's, you know, if you look at it, there are more than 50, 60 or smaller civil society, I mean, uh, grassroots organizations who work on these kind of issues. So these charismatic species are also a good way of leveraging, you know, people's support and participation. Um, we have a communities and resource governance program, which uh, looks at, uh, you know, which is basically uh, aimed at looking at law and policy, demystifying law and policy, you know, making it more accessible to the fisher communities, uh, coastal communities in general. Um, we look at issues of commons because most of the coastal and marine resources are what we call common pool resources. So, you know, governance is quite a tricky topic and that's going to be a bit of the core of my talk. Um, so, and then there is also, we, the way we work is also through networks. So we work with larger national level networks, such as National Fish Workers Forum and, you know, others, other smaller uh, unions, societies, and all of that through, you know, throughout the coastline. So even though we may not have directly presence or an office or field station in these sites, we do have, the way we work is through those networks, thereby kind of amplifying the work that we do. Um, and yeah, we do support quite a few, uh, you know, campaigns as well, both regional and national level campaigns, uh, mostly to ensure, you know, fisher rights and also their, uh, you know, also focusing on conservation issues as well. Like we also have an environmental education program. <clears throat> it's main focus being, uh, you know, place-based education. So most often, you know, the communities who are dependent on resources and, and uh, you know, where a lot of these outreach programs and all of that happen works under an assumption that, you know, people who live very closely with nature and resources are the ones who exploit it and do not have a sense of, you know, engagement or ownership over it. So there's a quite a bit of disconnected content and all of that, you know, stuff happening elsewhere that has no connections with their own lived lives, you know, being in full. So our, objective is to implement a place-based place education. Very recently, we started a more holistic program, which kind of brings together the various aspects of, uh, you know, our work together from gardens to diversity, biodiversity issues to, you know, livelihoods and all of that. So it's mostly looking at community well-being, um, not entirely for environmental benefits, but what we're increasingly finding is that if you need to make a change, make a dent, you really have to deal with people's you know, if people have to be ready to work on environmental issues, a lot of their day-to-day -day issues and challenges do need to be addressed. Otherwise, it's very unfair to expect them to engage on environmental issues. Very recently, I say, um, recently, like two, two couple of years back, we also, um, you know, took over the, the management and uh, running of this field station, which has been in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. For, and it's called Andaman and Nicobar Environment Team. It's been in the Andaman Islands for more than, 25, 30 years, it's been a field station that's facilitated a lot of work on the islands. And yeah, that's the field station that I talked about. Yeah, that's it. I will get into the topic of the, uh, you know, talk now. So the fishery sector in India, I'm sure a lot of you here are already aware of it, but I thought it's for those who do not have a comprehensive understanding of the sector. It's important to understand fisheries as a sector to, you know, before undertaking any management intervention. So, um, you know, these are heavily contested. The coastlines that we see when we work along the coastlines, you know, we often do not realize that these are heavily contested coastlines. When I say contested, there are so many interests, groups that, you know, focus on the coastline. So from you know, now increasingly with the port-based kind of, uh, you know, development vision of the nation along with, say, real estate, you know, tourism, and then there is fisheries, and then there are all kinds of other problems which are also going on. You know, industrial development is also focused along the coastline. So it's a heavily contested space. We have about one fishing hamlet, general, you know, we have about 3,000 or, you know, close to 3,000 fishing hamlets in along the entire coastline of India. So that's pretty much a fishing village or coastline every three, four kilometers around the coastline. So in terms of how it's spatially spread out, it's it's very widely spread out. And it's, 
you know, gen quickly to give a glimpse of what the demographic profile is. The reason I'm in talking about this is because it is critical in terms of when it comes to resource management and conservation and all of that. Um, you know, we have a huge population that are directly dependent on fishing, you know, fish of, traditional fisher families, but also close to 16 million or so have been estimated to be associated along the, you know, with the fisheries as a sector as well, not just as practicing fishers, but in the you know rest of the trade links and all of that. Education is quite, uh, you know, poor in the fisher communities. A lot of them are below poverty line, particularly in certain states. It's very glaring, like Andhra Pradesh, for instance, even though the state average is, you know, quite less in terms of below poverty line. But if you look specifically at the fisher communities, a lot of them are below, you know, the poverty line. So they're one of the more marginalized communities when it comes to development priorities as well. So, so if you look at some of these states here, you know, even though the state's general average with in terms of poverty line is not so high, if you look at the fisher communities, they're, they're quite performing quite badly. So that's one thing that I thought I wanted to add. And so it's extremely diverse. So there's not, you know, there's diversity in terms of resources, there's diversity in terms of the fishing practice, uh, you know, how they access it, how they, you know, engage with it. And also diversity at the community level as well, you know, different regions, class, languages, and all of that, that also has an implication on how resources are managed. But the main critical thing is that, you know, it, it is an open access fisheries. And what it does is because there are no mechanisms or safety nets in place, it leads to very unfair access of trees, you know, in terms of how resources are being allocated between different you know, sections, if I say social economic sections within the fisher community. So, you know, the mechanized and the motorized sector tend to, you know, mostly the mechanized sector tends to, you know, kind of have access to resources way more than the non-mechanized sector, mainly because technology and other issues as well, but it's basically the same pool of resources that is available and, you know, it's just one a bit of unfair advantage for a certain group of you know fisheries to have to have over the other. So you know with the the main differences between the mechanized and non-mechanized sector, and you know this kind of historically has been there in terms of you know conflicts between the communities, the you know the small-scale fisher communities and the you know the the mechanized sector as well. The so that, that kind of has led to a history of conflicts, both violent and, you know, political kind of, cam, you know, conflicts as well over the years. So there is a history to, you know, how resource as a common, you know, common pool resource that's available, that's being harvested and, you know, access to it has, has, has quite a deep rooted kind of history of conflict. And uh, if you look at the governance systems quite, there, there used to be quite a few traditional government systems in place in the past. Um, prior to this becoming an open access fishery, there, was, there were quite a few spatial and temporal kind of management systems in place in various places. A lot of them have, you know, over a period of time, because they do not enjoy the kind of powers that, you know, some of these government systems used to have, you know, it, it seems to have, you know, a lot of it has, seems to have, uh, you know, Sorry, I don't know if this is an emergency, but I've been getting a call from someone a few times. Sorry, I'm just going to take this call. Go ahead, Vanina, turn the phone up if you feel it's something.
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so sorry about that. There was a, you know, someone has been trying to call me multiple times this morning. So yes, um, so in terms of governance systems, you know, uh, increasingly in in systems like India, where the, the diversity of fisheries is high, you know, it's a common pool resources where you know one single agency generally cannot you know enforce or regulate management at such large spatial scales because it requires huge amount of investment to be able to cover each and every you know fisheries operations to be able to regulate it and manage it at that level so quite often you know it's it it often doesn't work the way it's intended to even though in by in paper there are lots of regulations in terms of implementation there are huge challenges and uh, you know there are increasingly on you know the national marine fisheries policy for instance identifies you know that enhanced cooperation is needed you know between various stakeholders and between the state and the center for you know achieving common goals and you know there's a lot of talk about uh, you know sustainability that needs to be focused on in, in the fisheries sector and the new policy but you know bringing it into enforcing a lot of this would entail you know a lot of different, a, a completely fresh perspective. Right now, it's a very top-down management system where there is the ministry and then, you know, the center and then the state implementing a lot of fisheries, often within the territorial waters being a state subject, you know, a lot of that is controlled at the state level and then there's the center coming in and it's the, you know, beyond the territorial waters. So quite often there is a fair bit of, you know, and then the fisher communities are, have historically just played the role of a producer, not someone who has any role in, in actual management and deciding what is right and wrong in a particular area. They've quite often been just, you know, passive contributors or passive producers of sorts. So in that context, what we've been looking at is, you know, are there other models? So, you know, models such as participatory models have been quite often, you know, found to be more effective, in probably not at much larger spatial scales, but at, at least at smaller spatial scales, it's been found to be like a good, way of ensuring that there is better compliance and, and you know, enforcement of a lot of these regulations. So we started our work in the Islands. Uh, we didn't have a plan to, you know, look at the larger management of the fisheries when we started off, uh, but we found that the Lakshadweep Islands being, you know, more or less e ecologically like a homogenous system, all of them being coral atolls, we, we kind of focused our efforts there. You know, it's also a union territory, so smaller administrative units. Um, you know, it's a very literate population, I think 92, 93% literacy level. And, you know, also socially, it's relatively homogeneous, not entirely, but in comparison to say the mainland or other island systems like Andaman Island groups and things, so that it's a lot more homogeneous. Um, there are the variations, say for instance, the Minikoi Island, which is the southernmost island, in the you know luxury archipelago, that's socially culturally a very different unit altogether. But other than that, more or less the other islands had a fair bit of you know homogeneity. And the other main motivation for us to focus on luxury is that you know it it primarily looked at. Uh, I mean, we, we were interested in the Poland line tuna fishery there, which is one of the most sustainable fishing practices that you know, commercial fishing practices that one can think of. So um, the way it operates, for, I mean, a lot of you might know, but for those who do not know, the way it operates is there is a, uh, you know, it targets mostly skipjack tuna, which is a very resilient species, high turnover rates, high fecundity species. So it targets a particular species that is, you know, quite resilient. It has literally no bycatch. Um, actually, violence, like I said, are coral at all. So basically, they are uplifted reefs. Uh, so the reef health is critical. So in a way, you know, the, the fishing pressure has been kept off the reefs because, you know, of Poland line tuna fishing because they, the local communities have not been targeting the, the fish resources in the lagoon and in the reef areas, but rather going for tuna resources that are offshore. The way it works is they have what you call live bait. Um, 
They collect the light weight from within the shallow lagoon, keep it alive, and take it out into the open sea. Once they find the tuna, they you know they use the pole and line and throw the live bait into the water, attract the tuna towards the boat, and you know chum the water, and then later you know harvest the tuna one by one. And and also very little habitat impact as well. So it's a it's a very sustainable fisheries, which is why we got interested in this fishing. But when when we got there, we also realized that. It's not all that sustainable because, uh, you know, the bait fish that is a critical component for keeping the fisheries alive is, you know, very limited resource that comes from within the lagoons and reef areas and their populations were significantly declining, uh, you know, on, on most islands. So that, that became a problem where, you know, fishers had to go up to eight hours to go and catch a, the live bait to catch tuna, which is just half an hour away. So, you know, in terms of operational costs and things like that started making things a lot more difficult for them. Um, there is also not a good supporting market system in place. They are reliant on a few, you know, middlemen who, who tend to regulate the prices. It also goes through due to into Sri Lanka, the market for the way they, uh, you know, commodify the resources is by converting it into dry tuna called mass meat. And must mean as high demand in Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia, and, you know, sometimes even in Japan, high quality, you know, in other places it's called Maldive fish. So it has high uh, demand, and but nevertheless, the trade is regulated by, like I said, a few middlemen. So it has its own consequences for the fisher communities. Uh, a lot of it is also sold fresh on the islands. And then, quite of uh, in more recent years, in the last three four years. There are also a lot of unsustainable practices that have come in when it comes to bait fish resources. They have been using strong LED lights to attract fish, and then it makes them easier to harvest, especially the spawning stocks and others have been targeted a lot more. So, you know, it has affected the, the resource availability quite a bit, which is pushing them to move, moving away from pole and line tuna fishing and exploring other forms of, you know, fishing practices in this area. So in a way, this is also very compatible. It provides livelihoods to more than 60% of the you know, people on these islands indirectly or indirectly provide some benefits, you know, livelihood benefits for a majority of the islanders. It's one of the main economic activity on the islands. So, and it's very, like I said, because of its sustainable nature, it doesn't put too much pressure on the reefs and other systems as well. So we began our work in 2013 by looking at the bait fish resources Uh, you know, a few colleagues who've been working there for years uh, in, suggested we start looking at bait fish resources and see what's actually happening in the water. And then we started our work, um, worked on four islands, and, and that's where, you know, some of the results were showed island level, you know, variations, um, especially with, you know, main target species like sprats and silver sides. Um, what we also found is that, that, you know, protocols to monitor bait fish because these are small pelagics and, you know, large cooling fish. It's very difficult to quantify them in water. So we've been dealing with a lot of difficulties that we've kind of now working on a video method for, you know, which doesn't involve counting while down in the, in, in, you know, underwater, but record videos and come back and use, uh, you know, various applications and softwares to, to identify populations and stuff. Uh, we're looking at, you know, making this technology also kind of transfer to the local diver community. There's a lot of trained divers on luxury is another advantage. So we're trying to transfer this knowledge back to the local communities there so that they can also, you know, start monitoring the big fish and not have to depend on us to come and, you know, count them for them. So what we also found is that the cust there are a lot of customary practices already in place, particularly on the Minikoi Island, which I talked about is you know, a bit of an outlier from the rest of the luxury. Um, what they have are very strong, you know, spatial and temporal re restrictions on date fishing. So just to, I think it's important to also mention that the practice of, uh, you know, this Poland line tuna fishing was, has been there on Minikoi for a fairly long period. I think it's more than a thousand year old on these islands. It came, Minikoi, you know, historically, socially, culturally is more a part of, you know, Maldives. And, you know, Maldives is where the Poland line tuna fishing is being practiced even now. So Minikoi 
Finicoyans have a very strong local bait fish management system because they cannot, they do not have any islands. It's an isolated island. So, you know, they do not have access to other islands. So, they, it's mandatory that they manage their bait fish resources adequately well. And they've been doing it for over a thousand years and haven't faced too much of bait fish crisis like the other islands have. Main reason being those customary traditional practices that are in place, you know, including you know, coral holders are given out, you know, before the start of a season dedicated to certain boats, you are supposed to take bait only from those boulders once, you know, if there is a crisis with baits and things like that. So there are very strong spatial restrictions, temporal as well. Not all species has been, you know, is allowed to be harvested during all periods of the year. There are certain timing when they're banned. There are systems like Lavari, which is basically a bait fish holding tank that they've come up with. And whatever is excess is put in that and reused the next day uh, so that there's no wastage as well. There are, you know, sometimes even catch sharing for practices. Uh, you know, they also have strong rules for catching tuna from fish aggregation devices because quite often that's, you know, these fish aggregation devices are a sure shot for the, you know, local fishermen because even if they don't find large pools outside, you know, it is possible to do this from. Uh, you know, it, it is once you get back to the fish aggregation devices, it is possible to uh, it's possible to you know go to the FADs and there's definitely you know tuna available there and they come. That's like a guaranteed catch for them, right? So these are some of the that the one on the bottom left is the library that I was talking about. This is a more uh, you know more you know, more new frame, you know, new kind of system they built. It traditionally used to be wooden, you know, holes and things. And that's just to give you a sense of what, what those things look like, what the customary practices look like. You know, there are certain kinds of, this is basically a resource map of where that's a cypunculin, an invertebrate, uh, you know, a minor phyla. So they, they even use some of those as baits and things, you know, so there's that level of mapping they have. So these are where the sprats are available. These are where some of the apogonids are available. You know, fusilias and others are available in different sites. Um, you know, they have, like I said, they have spatial and temporal bands as well. Nets are not allowed to be used in every parts of the lagoon. There are some areas where nets are not allowed. They have clear names for each of those. They have, you know, they follow the lunar calendar to try and identify, you know, what are the spawning periods of some of the bait fish species and all of that. So there's a fair bit of, you know, existing knowledge there which was for us was a good way to kind of, you know, take some of this knowledge system. So when the, you know, fisheries from Minikoi was taken to other islands in Lakshadweep back, it was it happened in the late 50s and early 1960s. You know, the fisheries department had taken this practice of pole and tuna fishing from Minikoi and trained other islands to, you know, use the same kind of technology, but they didn't, uh, you know, some of these customary practices were not, transferred along with it. So, you know, the rest of the islands do face a lot of big fish crisis. And there were a lot of data gaps as well, you know, while the statistics showed something, the fishermen felt differently. So we decided to start a very simple community-based catch monitoring program. In 2014, it was a co-created, pro you know, protocol where the communities and I, all of us sat down and created a table based on what they wanted to monitor, also based on what we wanted as information. So it was, I specify this mainly because it was good to have those conversations even around say concepts like catch per unit effort, why is it not sufficient if you just tell us how much of fish you've landed, but it's very critical for us to know, you know, how much effort you put in it, how do we calculate effort? So, you know, a lot of these conversations happened around, you know, these things as well. Uh, you know, yeah, that's like a community-based monitoring program as, you know, why we started it off and, and, and you know, the, the context of starting it. And we, uh, we implemented it for four years um, on four major fishing islands. About 50 fishing boats have participated on and off. Um, that's a percentage of the, you know, total number of boats on, on these islands. And we have about 4,000 plus fishing records. So every fishing trip is like, you know, seen as a unit. Um, some interesting information has come up from those records. 
uh, you know, especially with the weight monitoring, you could see a couple of species where, uh, you know, sprats were the main target species, including spawning sprats as well. So, you know, more than 75 percentage of the total catch is like 80 percentage of the total catch. Catch is entirely sprats, and the rest of it are, you know, other species like, you know, Cronus, uh, you know, Fusilia, you know, Apogon, Silver Sides, and all of that. Uh, we found this is something that the fisher community wanted to monitor is, you know, whether the FADs are creating a problem because they were noticing that the fish they're catching at the FADs are much smaller and, according to them, less healthier. Uh, so they wanted to they wanted to monitor what's happening in terms of the size of the, you know, tuna. Uh, that are caught both at FADs and away from the FADs. We didn't find much of a variation, even though the ones caught at the FADs were slightly smaller, in, uh, specifically for skipjack. Uh, for the yellowfin, there were significant differences. Uh, you know, most of the yellowfins that were caught at the FADs were very small, uh, you know, up to four or five kilos when, you know, on an average, when they catch these same yellow fins outside, they at least weigh more than 15, you know, 12, 14 kilos. And we looked at also fuel usage. That's something they wanted to track and monitor is the amount of fuel they've been using. Pretty much, you know, similar in terms of year to year fluctuations. Um, this needs updating. This is up to 2017 when we had actually compiled all of this and synthesized. And island wise variations as well in terms of, you know, uh, how much is caught on an average by each boat. And, you know, it's difficult to maintain the kind of momentum with these kind of, you know, programs because it's entirely a voluntary kind of an initiative. So for the communities to, you know, for, to kind of incentivize their participation in some way or the other, we had, uh, what we had done is we every year release these calendars called Malsya Sambatu Bhavi, like it's fish for the future, what we call it. So, you know, it basically has a lot of information about sustainability or even their own catch monitoring data sets are shared back with them through these, you know, calendars, but also each and every board that has participated. Uh, some of the main participants, you know, the best 10 are given like separate coverage in each of these, you know, calendars. So they are quite happy and they, they look forward to these calendars every year because it's something that is circulated across the islands. Um, and uh, yeah, so we also use this to share a lot of outreach kind of, you know, information as well. And for us, the catch monitoring program has been a great learning exercise in terms of how we engage. Uh, but what has happened is, you know, For us, it has become a lot more. So we take this information back. Every boat is given the information back in terms of, you know, what, what kind of transpired from their own, uh, you know, what is, what is the data from their boat tail over an entire season. And we take that information and analyze it and take it back to each and every boat. So for us, that became like a good point of conversations. And from there, we started, you know, talking more about managing these resources, particularly, you know, some of these, um, you know, unsustainable practices that were kind of creeping into the into the fisheries there. So kind of started off with a you know action research on social economic and other aspects of the island fisheries because if you want to engage with the communities, it's really and especially on managed at management levels, it's really critical to know the community and who the where the power centers are, who are making decisions within the community, and all of those are you know critical things. So we started off by doing a bit of research on, you know, the social, ecological, and economic aspects of the fisheries, and then also, you know, some of them as we began with a stakeholder mapping exercise. So we looked at the primary stakeholders, secondary stakeholders, and tertiary stakeholders as well. We found that, you know, unsurprisingly, primary stakeholders were the fishers and the fisheries department, but the traders as well. And a lot of this is based on, you know, interviews and, and perception studies and things like that. Um, they found the panchayat, interestingly, police also as a secondary stakeholder. And, you know, groups like us, the NGOs and others, wholesale dealers, politicians, religious leaders, forest department, all of them were found to be 
you know, tertiary stakeholders in, in our analysis. So, you know, it's very clear that, you know, the traders are also one of the key stakeholders who need to be part of some of these conversations. We also did what you, you know, some simple analysis to try and arrive at who, where are those power centers within the community. There will be individuals who are leaders or may not be, you know, leaders in the, in the sense that they are elected representatives or anything. But they might be natural leaders within these communities as well who are very critical. So we found that, you know, along with the deputy collector, fisheries department, panchayat and all of that, there are also individuals within the community who have a very strong influence on, you know, decision making and all of that. And this is critical information because this helps us engage at a management level. It's not sufficient to just have, you know, you can't have conversations at random without the understanding the dynamics within the community well enough. So that's where it began it kind of set the platform for our community-based cash monitoring program, kind of set the platform for participatory management. And, you know, we, the objective is to get all of us together in one place, you know, the researchers, the community members, the local panchayat leaders, the fisheries department, the local, you know, fisher communities, all of them in one place. Um, yeah. So the whole objective is to make decision making a lot more democratized. There's a lot of information that the fisher communities can bring on to the table. And, you know, there's an assumption that somehow there seems to be this underlying assumption that the fisheries, fisher communities are incapable of managing their resources, which is not true. You know, it requires a lot. You know, if you're in, if you have zero power, obviously you're not, you don't have any, you know, control over, over what is happening over the resources, right? So what we, what co-management, for instance, as a framework requires is A, like, uh, you know, mentioned here, it requires a lot of democratic, democratic decision-making. And what it also requires is decentralized decision-making, right? It, it has to be a collective decision-making of sorts. Uh, some of the decisions are best left to, you know, fisher communities. Like I said, it's not that easy because a lot of the traditional governance systems have already collapsed in many places. So it requires a lot of, you know, help hand holding. And if you ask the fisher communities, they themselves will say that, you know, we need the fisheries department, you know, sign just all of them on board. But let's collectively sit and make those decisions. And then it requires a bit of devolution of powers. They have very easily can become your eyes and ears out in the sea. And, you know, not just from the fisheries monitoring and, and enforcement point of view, but also from a generally from a strategic and, you know, security point of view as well. They're, they're very of, often, you know, very critical sources, but quite often they're marginalized and not given that kind of recognition or whatever. So their attitude is also like whatever, you know, you don't care. Kind of attitude, right? So, we started the first, you know, ever co-management consultation in Lakshadweep uh, in 2019. Um, we we were really, you know, lucky to have a fisheries department, which was also, though tentative, they were quite supportive and ready to kind of look at what is it that we're proposing. We've been proposing this idea of co-management with the, you know, fisheries department there as well. The other advantage working with Lakshadweep is that, you know, Most of the mid to senior level, you know, officials are all local islanders as well. So they do empathize, they do, you know, understand the situation on the ground quite well. It was a little bit more easier to have these co-management consultations. And, uh, you know, it was quite, it was quite, uh, you know, quite heartening to see the department, including the secretary of fisheries that, you know, attended the meeting in Kavarati. Um, I think the, the deputy collector also by chance happened to drop, drop in by accident to the, you know, when the meeting was going on. So there was a lot of support that was given. Uh, so the, the main objective was that, you know, three different kinds, and we held it on, on uh, you know, three major islands that has fisheries going on, Poland and Kuna fisheries going on. And the communities had suggested action, and to begin action, you know, they'd suggested at least stopping a fair, uh, at least two or three mainly harmful practices that are, that are not good old in the long term, you know, things that everyone is in agreement with. 
okay but someone has to stop otherwise you know the other is not going to stop everyone wants to stop but if one is not stopping then you know it doesn't make sense for the rest of them to stop so you know there's collectively there is uh, agreement but individually there there seems to be disagreement so this kind of a when you give them that assurance to come together and make those decisions and especially with the support of the fisheries department offering to formalize some of the decisions through government orders and all of that you know the, the fishery community is required forthcoming they themselves decided to stop light fishing um they decided to phase out these really tiny what they call mosquito nets so it basically extracts everything in the you know that is associated with the live baits their eggs their you know larvae sprats all of them get harvested along with it so people are aware of it uh, aware of the consequences that it causes but you know facing them out means everyone has to stop so over a period of you know year or so you know it was decided that the these nets would be phased out these are all decisions that the communities came up with not any of us you know enforcing or suggesting these decisions and the third decision they made was to stop throwing all the tuna waste into the lagoon which used to happen uh, but you know so those three things they wanted the government to send out orders and the panchayat and the local police to help enforce it and they were happy to do the monitoring of it and you know collectively enforce these things there was some pushback from certain communities of the i mean certain sections of the community uh, especially on one island but you know those were also kind of slowly resolved over a period of time so we did get a fair bit of traction within the communities unfortunately after all of this then the covid lockdown happened we you know we were not able to get permits on time to be back there to implement some of these things so uh you know the the director of fisheries retired and got replaced by someone else so now we have to restart some of these things over all over again but you know if some of these government orders are put in place it actually acts as a very strong sends a very strong message to the fisher communities to you know that there is support from the department they're listening to your voices and and you know and i am sure that you know enforcement and and especially compliance with these things will be much more you know efficient yeah so that's where we stopped off you know now does community with management work everywhere um i would say yes and no it depends on the context now, so like i said there's a fair bit of uh, the reason why a cash monitoring program worked very well is because the community there are very literate they're not hesitant to engage with pen and paper and you know write down these details in fact for them it was quite an exciting thing to do for at least for some you know boards that participated um the the main thing is that you know you need the communities also require a certain amount of cohesion the other islands we work are in the andaman andaman i group of islands right and in the andamans if you look at the fisheries there it's no not just one there is there are no local islanders in and andamans per se all of there must settlers who have gone there during various periods some of them have been there you know 70 80 years back they were settled there some of them went much later and some of them quite recently and there are different communities there are telugu communities who engage with fisheries there bengalis uh, you know sometimes people from kerala uh, you know so kerans people who been who you know who kind of relocated or were brought in during the colonial periods from burma so it's like a mixed community there and and you know putting in some kind of a large co management work at this level like for instance what we did in lakshadweep is not going to be easy in a context like the andamans just to get all of these communities operate in different you know different silos so you know so it's very difficult to get all of them to come together and work together because the resources are pretty much shared so it's not going to be the same thing on mainland india it's going to be even more challenging because there are so many different stakeholders and things are changing you know the context and things are changing regularly um when as to look at the there needs to be a lot of support from the government as well in terms of you know uh, providing support for these kind of initiatives um and ability to self sustain the communities should have the ability to kind of sustain these things on their own as well the drive you know the ability to internalize what these things mean what is the need for having knowledge or data in a certain format 
you know, why do you need to man, you know, what is the role of different groups and, and there needs to be a willingness to decentralize some powers to the communities, you know, everyone being willing to sit together and talk about these issues and resolve them, you know, collectively. So as the way forward, we're following up with the fisheries department, there have been some, I mean, a lot of you would be aware of the, you know, kind of turmoil that's happening with the luxury pile. And so we're not very sure what it would mean when we start engaging with the communities again. Um, we've reinitiated some dialogues, we've strengthened engagements with, you know, we need to, you know, we need to start engaging with the panchayat a lot more and you know we definitely need like an iterative approach which is constantly evolving as the ground realities change here is the team from the sustainable fisheries program um Ilasha works with on the mainland but aside from that all the others uh you know ishan is the program officer mehbu is a local luxury islander from kadmat who is our main person people's person interacting with the you know communities there prerna is doing all the importer work assessing the populations in the world, you know, eight fish populations in the water. Abel works, works quite hard, as you can see, has been working with, he's been the one documenting a lot of the, you know, the traditional fishing practice, you know, the traditional and cultural systems in the island of Minikoi. Ajit has been doing a lot of the, I think I saw Ajit's name somewhere here in this group. Uh, Ajit has been doing a lot of work with the he's the one who's been doing the stakeholder analysis the you know perception studies and all of that um and also helping implement the catch monitoring program so on level there is fauzia who is uh, who started working with the octopus fisheries on these islands but now interested in aspects of gender and you know their engagements uh, the role of women in, in in the fisheries as well right so that's pretty much it i'm happy to wrap this Thank you, thank talk you. and if there are questions happy to yeah yeah thank we'll you. just get to that thank you so much for that very interesting talk um just before jump in we jump into discussion uh we would like to get feedback from our uh, audience and i've just uh, put that into the, the link into the chat box so just before we jump into that please we would love your feedback and i mean that's a very interesting talk and uh Absolutely loved it, and uh, you know, wish. Uh, have you ever seen any example of potential areas where you can uh, carry out co-management in the mainland? I think uh, Kerala has, you know, even in the fisheries policy, have have identified co-management as a framework. You know, unfortunately, we haven't worked much in Kerala, but that's something we'd like to rectify as well and to. You know, given that these uh, village committees and, you know, village level committees and all of them are identified as, you know, structural frameworks, I think that's a great positive, you know, you know, forward looking kind of a kind of an approach. And I think we really need to look at those spaces, especially, you know, NGOs like us need to look at those spaces for better engagement with communities. Because it all, because the core of it is actually these decentralizing powers to a certain extent to the community. And I think it's very critical because once you have no say in what you're doing, people are not going to be bothered about resource management or anything, right? So there needs to be some incentivization. What one needs to look at is also some kind of a rights-based approach where you have spatial allocations and you know that this whole open access resource management is not really a long-term sustainable option. And I think that's right. going on for a long time. But, but what about, I mean, the sheer size of stakeholders, you know, that you have on the mainland? I mean, how can you even, like, bring everyone on to so the same to, thing? One will have to... So, when you want to scale this up, say, from a village level to a state level, then you will have to work with larger, you know, political, you know, these groups. Say, for instance, the National Fish Workers Forum, it's not a political group, but it's a group of, you know, law, uh, all over India, everyone's come, you know, everyone who's many uh, unions, organizations, societies, well, you know, part of the small scale fisheries have come together and set up this National Fish Workers Union. So you need to work with these leaders and, you know, and people from there. There needs to be some level of trust. We can't work 
this is not going to happen overnight. You know, we just can't walk into any of these areas and expect to implement a co-management framework. That's definitely not going to happen. What we'll need is, you know, a long-term engagement and it has to start slowly, slowly, slowly. And once that trust is there, things will start moving a lot more. And, and uh, um, up will become, so once you implement it in a certain small spatial unit, it will you know, expand as well. Sorry. Yeah. Pratish, Pratish, yeah, go ahead. And then, you know, the, another uh, complication with, uh, uh, with the mainland will be like, you know, different multi-species um, fishery. So the complication within, you know, even if you're going for village to village, the, the multi-fishery um, aspect is also complicating the things, right? So um, co-managing within, uh, within the village with different species will be, which will be adding more complication to the, uh, uh, the whole uh, concept, right? Um, are you agreeing with that? Or like, you know, what do you, what do you have to say about that? It is, it's definitely complicated. I mean, nothing is easy, but you know, but I think the best way to do it is to, there's no one solution. Like I said, one has to look at the specific, you know, spatial unit at which one is planning these interventions and then try and see there are multiple resources say for instance if you are looking at uh, resources like trap fisheries or say you know octo uh, squid fisheries and things like that. those are like smaller spatially you know limited kind of resources or at least not like wide-ranging kind of species so some of those you can target it's basically the ability of what's the core is that it's the ability for consultation you know consultative processes. It's not about a particular resource. It's basically, are you able to put in those systems in place? Once it's there, you know, you can discuss about, depending on what resource you're managing or what kind of fisheries you're interested in managing, different subsets of that, you know, from within the village can come and engage in those conversations. You may not be able to sit with everybody and resolve all problems. You may have to work through subsets, but to get to that stage, there's a lot of you know, a lot of other preliminary steps to be put in place. The first being the trust and, you know, and reliability with, on both sides, right? Right now, the departments and, you know, scientists and all of that are all on one side, you know, the community members are, you know, there's official community members are different. Sometimes there are internal dynamics amongst them as well. It's all not the same. There are economic, social, cultural, caste-based all these way differences are there. It's not going to be easy working in a space like India, but you have to start somewhere, you know. And once that process starts, it will slowly, as confidence builds, it will, it will start gaining momentum. The point I was making about Kerala is that it's already identified and, you know, given a legal kind of a space for those kind of things to exist. In other states, it's going to be really difficult to even talk about these things and get to that stage. You know, so that's that way there's a big positive sign there and one really needs to look at how to you know go about it i can see deepak's question i'll just read it out i understand the catch is being monitored and the fisheries co-management effort is being mobilized my question is whether a risk assessment framework or a reference is considered to determine how bad or good a fisheries is doing in terms of its sustainability Probably that is important to see whether the ongoing co-management activities are working or not and how such conservation goes with the stakeholders. So do you guys uh, have any? I would, yeah, uh, I would be a little cautious before putting, uh, you know, directly linking the outcomes of a certain intervention into what is happening with the resource. Because from what we've seen, in over the years with the data that you know what our fisheries resources are showing is that it has it's not always direct correlation between you know say availability of sardines to the fishing effort right sometimes sardine populations increase and go down and that may or may not be because of the co-management efforts that you're doing could be entirely because of factors that are not linked with anything that anyone is doing right so quite often these kind of indicators that we use are one needs to carefully look at so what we do is we look at qualitative indicators right what are the engagement levels of people in the program, right? Is the fisheries department 
for instance, supporting these causes? You know, how often have they attended these meetings? Or, you know, what is the level of engagement from the fish, fish you know, fisher communities? Are they, what is the level of issues that they're taking up and dealing with? So I think those are like more, so even for, in terms of the data that they're collecting, there's so much of mistrust relating to the data that the fisher communities have collected because it hasn't followed a certain, unfortunately, I have to say this is that, you know, it hasn't followed or a stratified random sampling you know, framework or whatever, right? So there are all these, so we're not arguing about the, about the validity of the data, but for us, it's more the process is more important, not the output of it. You know, the, the data, the agreement with the fisher communities is that don't give us wrong data, even if you're not participating, no pressure. You know, nobody has to give this data set, you give it if you want, and we, in return, we are not going to let their identities know be known because people don't want it anonymity when they were contributing data sets. They didn't want, say if they had a big catch, they didn't want the local department to know, okay, this particular boat got a big catch or, you know, bumper catch or whatever. So they wanted the anonymity and then they were comfortable giving you data. Initially, there were problems with the data sets. We could see that some of it were not, you know, not entirely reliable because perfect numbers and things like that started turning up. So then we had to have multiple conversations and talk about why we need it in a certain framework. It's not done intentionally. They do giving the data back, expect thinking that okay, these people are running this program, I should, you know, I should help them out, kind of a thing. But made it clear that you know we don't need so there's no pressure on the communities. I believe some of the data sets are reliable, but whether it's usable or not is up to you know thing. But for us, the process, like I said. The process of creating that data, the table, all those conversations around it, and that leading to management is way more valuable than the accuracy of the data. Uh, uh, so, so just, uh, Navin, just to follow up to uh, Deepak's question, I guess the, 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 the question from Deepak, Deepak is coming from um, uh, how healthy um, uh, the species uh, uh, you know, population. So um, for you, the example that you mentioned from uh, lecture DBs is much more in a, in a more sustainable, um, you know, position, right? It, it, it was, it was handling in a, in a way that, you know, the, the fishery was going in a very, uh, at least in a very uh, um, uh, good way. Uh, what about the, you know, species, which is not, we don't even know, like, in you know, let's case the, take the case of the sardine, sardine, you know, one time, uh, like, you know, we all are relying on uh, the indicators, what the government is mentioning. So um, one, one year, the sardine pop, uh, you know, catch has been increased. So uh, there was a, uh, there was a report that, you know, sardine population has increased, right? So we don't even know how the sardine population or the, like, you know, how healthy the, the population is. Um, so in that case, uh, won't it be um, essential to know that that population before we engaging? So, uh, like, if we consult with the with the fishermen, we get some kind of an information about like you know how how hard it is to catch and you know how to report and all those things. But um, but but still, like you know. Don't we need a, a biological aspect of like looking at like you know, how healthy the population is, and then you know call uh, other side of the island, then ask their you know practical opinion, and then you know make a decision together, right? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, completely agree. There's a huge role for science and you know research to play in terms of telling what exactly is happening with the stocks. That's not entirely. And that the communities also agree that, you know, hey, we need researchers, we need scientists and all of that. But, you know, I think the point is that we also need a say in these things. Hey, we also, we are the, finally the ones, fisheries is always looked at as a biological problem to solve. It's actually a people's problem to solve. Fisheries mm -hmm. management is a people's problem. It's not a biological problem. So, you know, if, if we recognize that and give them the right kind of, you know, opportunities to engage and, and, you know, and, and contribute to it. I don't think any fisherman is like, let's fish out all the fish in the sea. I hate all the fish. That's not the approach anyone is coming from. Right. So I think it's just an, op they also want management and sustainability and all of that. They are also concerned, but you know, it's how do we arrive at working mechanisms where scientists do their role, you know, the fishermen do their role, departments do their role. It's, it's just a mutually 
it actually to me it's like a win-win situation but it's difficult because it's a like i said it's a people's problem and there are inherent baggages and understanding of okay that's fishermen that's how they are or these are scientists that's how that's what they keep telling the statistics it doesn't mean anything you know all these approach all these inherent understandings are there which you know which you need to be able to put aside that's what we saw at the meeting in Lakshadweep is that ability to put those things aside and you know everyone coming and talking there were scientists from DST you know science and technology you know there was the director of fisheries you know secretary panchayat members so all of them sitting and having that conversation makes a huge difference even though they may contribute support not support but at least that idea is planted somewhere and then it starts slowly slowly paying dividend and you have to be diligent with it you can't have it as a one-year project two-year project and then move on that's actually more damaging than you know long-term sustaining yeah 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 uh, uh, any plan for you guys to uh to look at the uh the uh the uh, or look at the the bait fish. Uh, bait fish is the main problem there when uh, where you handle the uh, the co management, right? So are you are you guys um, how how are you guys gonna be looking at the performance of this co management, or in other words, like you know how you rate the success of this co management? It's going to be difficult. Like Deepak, that's pretty much like what Deepak asked as well. Is that you know how do you assess the success? It's not going to be easy because especially with when it comes to natural systems you really do not know if the you know if the bait fish species populations have come down despite co-management you know local communities are also going to be feeling hey this hasn't made a difference us doing it it might be because of other factors so we need to have a more holistic kind of monitoring of these impacts uh, you know it's not going to be easy but we really need to look at those things uh, you know a little bit more holistically not just look at only the stocks but also look at engagement levels you know look at like i said use some qualitative indices as well okay, sure okay to understand success any other questions else? anyone else with questions or uh, queries uh, or if nobody have a question, I have a one question, but it's not nothing related with the the co management. I was I was just curious that uh, you know uh, you know I was curious where you work as a foundation. Um, I didn't see um, Gujarat, uh, Kerala, West Bengal, where like you know it's a you know highly um, you know uh, uh, fishery oriented uh, state, right? So, but I didn't see you guys more and not much engaged there, and then he's. Is there any reason or like? Uh, Sorry, I didn't catch that there was some disturbance. Uh, so I was asking, like, you know, I, I saw you, where you work uh, throughout the um, um, throughout India, yeah. and I, I didn't, I didn't see you guys working on in Gujarat, in you know, uh, Maharashtra, Kerala, and West Bengal. That's where, like, you know, they, they have like a, a huge uh, fishery resource, and then most of the economy is also depending on the fishery resources, right? So I was just curious, like, you know, is there any reason that you choose that those particular states over the others? Uh, with this work, we chose Lakshadweep, like I said, because it's a smaller unit. It's, you know, to some level, except for Minipa, you know, some of the other islands are relatively more homogenous, not like everyone's the same, same, every island is the same, it has differences as well, but overall, you know, a lot more neater systems to work in, which is why we, you know, looked at it. So probably a, a work like this in Gujarat would be a huge daunting task because you know it's politically charged, like you say, it's very uh, you know, it's very multi-species, multi, you know, multi-gear kind of fisheries. There'll be a lot of conflicts. There'll already be a lot of history and you know politics going on. So you know we wanted to try this out in a space like Rakshadeep where it's a lot more neater and cleaner and see if we go, you know, first gain our own experiences with this process before okay. 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 taking on large monsters like say Gujarat kind of fisheries or you know mainland fisheries. I can see a question here. What about marketing management? Yeah. How we can connect the island fishery with the international market? So I I don't know if connecting with an international market, I mean it's already an international market in the sense that it goes from 
Lakshadeep Masmin goes to Tutukri, and from Tutukri it goes to you know um, Sri Lanka, sometimes to Maldives and other places. That's like from our whatever commodity chain analysis and trading case study, we identified that's how it goes. But uh, you know. There have been other attempts at, uh, you know, setting up uh, canning factories in Lakshadweep so that fresh fish can be sold rather than converted to mass meat. You know, there have been other, many other attempts as well. Uh, so, you know, there there have been attempts, but I think uh, I think the earlier MP also, or the current MP, I think, had tried to, you know, directly link with, uh, you know, Sri Lanka and you know, not having to go through middlemen and all of that. So that was also tried, but it requires, it, it didn't work out. I think there were some politics involved there, so it didn't work out. So one needs a little bit more um, careful planning. These islands have very low carrying capacity. So literally there's no fresh water available easily for any of the, you know, just for people's use, there's limited fresh water. So to have large islands, plants or facilities and things so that is it's actually a challenge so space is very limited on you know the islands where fisheries happen so looking at looking at development and you know bringing the international market at a big level into the islands can have its own impact so one will have to plan it well and look at there were attempts to give it get it certified msc certification wwf was trying to you know get the fisheries certified so that you know, at least if they have access to international markets to sell fresh fish, you know, they get better returns because it's certified fish. So some of those attempts have been going on, but I think, uh, you know, even for the certification of the Polonine tuna fishing, some of these aspects like bay fish management and all of that has to be addressed. So you're focusing on that aspect. Yeah. Okay, great. Anyone else with questions, queries? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so what is the scope of uh, implementing this co-management exercise in case of some small case, uh, small scale fisheries, such as take net fishery, for example, in Maharashtra, where customary resource allocation is already being followed? But there is no official recognition for the same. Is there any scope or what? What can be done? Um, if you're from there and you work with some of these fisheries and things like that, one can definitely look at. So, are there are there fisher representatives? Is there a union? Is there a cooperative society or something of sorts with the fisher communities? Then you talk to them and see: Are they really looking at a formal recognition for? Formal recognition is also a little bit of a problematic space. It depends on who gives you the formal recognition. So, for instance, uh, in Nikoi, yeah, yeah. So, fisheries department could probably, if I don't know under what legal framework, it can offer some kind of a formal, probably under the NMFRA. Oh, sorry, the the Maharashtra Marine Fisheries Regulation Act or something. You make you could include the clause that use this particular fishery is a certain kind of, you know, rights over exclusive rights over a certain area or a certain kind of resource. That might be possible, but then there are other fisheries also operating in that, probably operating, I don't know. So if there are other fisheries operating in that same space, you may have to consider their access and yeah, shouldn't yeah. be un unfair advantage given to just one group and, you know, others being left out. So that's probably, I don't know the con. Okay, okay, sir, okay. So I can't give you specifics, but definitely look, approach the, you know, the unions or others and see if they're interested in getting it like, like exclusive rights, then probably talk to the department at a higher level, probably at the state department level and see if there are ways to get this recognized. Okay, okay, okay. Sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, one of the participants just got out of the meeting and he is like, uh, he's typing. I don't know whether it's a question or not, but uh, he's, he's trying to uh, get into the meeting. So, okay. I don't know. 
I guess that's it. Did anything come up, Pradesh? Uh, no, I, uh, I think that's it. Um, that's it? Yeah, uh, he's still typing, I don't know. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I guess like, you know, uh, if you don't have any question, like we can wind up and then if, if he wants to contact uh, Naveen later and then ask Naveen, him. if you don't mind, can you just uh, type in the email ID into the chat box? So if anyone wants, they can just get in touch with you later on. Yeah, thank it's you. It's a small end, the starting end is a small end. Oh, okay, so um, yeah. here's the question. Um, so- I don't think it, it makes a difference. Yeah. Um, so Naveen, um, uh, sorry for the um, trouble, uh, but uh, Srikant GB is, is asking, what is the approach of uh, current administration towards co-management? I don't know where, uh, what location he is asking, but uh, probably generally he's asking. Well, if it's in the Lakshadweep context, there was quite a bit of support and, you know, there's a lot of, um, I would say initially there was a bit of hesitation because we are a non-governmental organization coming from outside without, you know, probably having enough history of having worked there and all of that. So there was a bit of, like I said, it takes a while for them to see that we are there doing our work regularly in and out, you know, see us on the island engaging. And then this, they also, the department also used to see that when we have meetings, there's a lot of representation from the fisher communities, participation and all of that. So, you know, they were aware of the cash monitoring program and things. So that, so that way, it required a bit of time for everyone to, you know, have sufficient trust. But I think once the meeting happened, you know, the director at the meeting was offered to formally send out a government order and all of that. But I think, you know, once we had to leave and then, you know, some delays happened there, then he retired and then, you know, someone else came. And I think now issues have all escalated to another level. So probably those things have kind of lost traction, which is what we need to do once we go back. Um, generally, the fisheries department, I don't know. It's a very difficult thing for power devolution because power is very critical. You know? So to give certain aspects of your, you know, mandate to others and, you know, get them also on board, make them like partners and things. So that requires a bit of work. So it's not going to happen anytime soon, but, you know, in other places, it, it, like I said, it requires persistence and effort. It's not something in none of these will happen overnight. You know, results will not be obvious overnight as well. So, yeah. But that's how the environment sector is and we have to be prepared for that. We're used. Great. Thank you. Um, so, Pratish, I think we will wind up for the day. Yeah, I, I didn't see any more questions, so yes. Yeah, me too. So thank you, Naveen. Thank you so much for that very oh. interesting talk. <laughs> and good luck. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening quietly. Thank you.